Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Okay, folks. Cool. Thank you very much. I'm amazed that you're all still here. It's been a beautiful day outside. Thank you for being here because, like, it's a beautiful day outside. Seriously, most of the people I know who've had a beautiful day like this wouldn't even be here. They'd be <laughs> listening. This is that guy go on and on and on. This brings us to step 10. Which suggests we continue to take personal inventory. Step 4. And continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. We vigorously commence this way of living, and this is a way of living now, as we cleaned up the past. And that, this is what, at once when we have started to make our amends, we jump into step 10, at once. We start this as we make our amends. So, so we've got our amends list, we go and knock on doors, while we're locking, knocking on doors, we're doing this. This is where it collapses in on itself. They're not in you do one and then finish and then you do the next one. From the time we start step four, we get to step five, it sort of collapses in on itself. We're doing step ten when we do, sorry, doing step eight when we do step four. We go do step five, we do six and seven, we do, we've got our eight step list, it just skims over it, we've done that. We go out and do, we go out and do our, our amends. We start our amends the very next day after doing our fifth step, if not the same day. And while we're doing that, we're doing this. Because this is the way of life. This is what we've been leading up to. This is what we do for the rest of our lives. But we know how to do step four now. We can do step four on a, back, on a, on a, on a, on a napkin in a, in, in a restaurant. We can do it on the back of our hand if necessary. Hmm. We have entered the world of the spirit. What does that mean? I have now uh, uh, had had the spiritual awakening, uh, conscious contact with this power that has come into my life. And our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not a maintenance step. It's a growth step. I have to continue to grow, and I have to all through the day. Now when I'm walking out in life again, I have to learn how to live by using these tools. And I have to start watching for selfishness, self-centeredness, resentment, and fear all through the day. Step 10 is all through the day. From when I go wake up in the morning and I go out the door, I have to use these tools to grow. This is not an overnight matter, it says. It should continue for our lifetime. For our lifetime. This is the new way of life. There's no destination in our college numbers. It's a process. It's a way of life now. The destination, if anything, is when we leave this, when we leave this life with alcoholism, not of alcoholism or from alcoholism. That I, I, my ambition, if you like, is to die of something else. <laughs> Even though I've still got it, I want to die of something else. I don't want to buy an alcoholic death. I will die an alcoholic, but I don't want to die an alcoholic death. That's when you're a winner. You see, that's, you know, that's when you get. That's when you beat the game. Mm. But it's this way of life, and we have entered the world of the spirit. We've kicked open the door. We've removed what is blocking us from the power. We are now in contact with the power. What we need to do is not only grow in effectiveness. We need to keep the door open. So what we're doing here is we're watching for the very things that we saw in step four. That's why they say, call it how it works. This is how it works. Once we know how to do inventory, this is how it works. And it says, when, not if, these things show up. <laughs> and the other thing about I was saying, this growing and understanding effectiveness, this is a little bit like, this is a little bit like 
um, I've got a racing bicycle and my feet click into into the pedals and if I stop pedaling the bike slows down and stops if I can't get my foot out the pedal and put it down I fall over and working and work and this program is a little bit like this we have to continue to grow in in effectiveness otherwise if we stop we'll fall over so we've got to keep pedaling and it should continue for a life yeah okay <clears throat> And if I have done these steps fast, like in, in 30 days or something, and now I'm going out in life, I'm very fresh. I just had a conscious contact with this power. I've done these actions, and I'm going out in life again. And I remember how this was. I was still very, I didn't know how to live. This is how I learned how to live this new way of life, to watch for the things that took me back to page 52 and, you know, to be selfish and self-centered again, to remove it at once during the day. And, and they give us precise instructions how I'm going to do this. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. First direction. When these crop up, and that means they will crop up, they will. I ask God at once to remove them. Whenever I feel fear, whenever I, I feel a resentment, I ask God at once to remove it because I don't want it, because I know what it leads to. I ask God at once to remove it. I don't have to analyze it. I just recognize it. I ask God to remove it. And if I can't remove it at once, if I'm thinking about it more than five minutes, <laughs> I discuss them with someone immediately. And I make amends quickly if I've harmed anyone. Because, you know, I can just, something pops out of my mouth. I, I say something stupid to someone. And, and I have to make amends quickly. I, I I do. I say, I'm sorry I, I said like that, you know. At once. I clean up at once. And this is spiritual tools that I use all through the day. This is the new way of life. And if I do this every day, I will grow every day. And it will get easier and easier. And after a while, it will be... Uh, my mind will change, and it will, in the beginning, it's practice, practice, practice. But it will later be a, a normal function of my mind, you know. The, I won't have to do it every second like I had in it the beginning. becomes a habit. Yes. Then I resolutely turn my thoughts to someone I can help. Resolutely. And I, I, I usually say like this, watch for it, ask God to remove it, turn your thoughts, turn your thoughts to someone you can help. Watch, ask, turn. Watch, ask, turn. When these things crop up. And I can be at work and I can just turn to someone I can help. You know? Or I can, I can phone someone that I haven't talked to for a while. Just to turn. I have to turn. Get away from my head. And it doesn't necessarily mean another alcoholic. It's anybody. Yeah, that's what it I mean. It doesn't have to be another alcoholic. It's Wherever anybody, I am. Wherever we are. This is a spiritual practice. And it's a practice that we can continue for our lifetime. And it becomes a habit after a while. It's difficult. It can be difficult in the beginning because we've mm. really got to concentrate on it. Yeah. But after a while, it becomes automatic. Yes, automatically. Love and tolerance of others is our code, it says. It's a principle that we live by. And here comes the 10-step promises, which are just amazing promises. Amazing. 
And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. For by this time, sanity will have returned. The sanity that I asked for in step two have now returned. It's taken us from step three through to step ten to get back to the sanity that we were asking for in step two. It doesn't happen in step two. It happens in step ten. Yeah. We've got to do it all. We will seldom be, be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame, because now I can see the truth about alcohol. I know that alcohol is a poison for me, and I don't even think of it. I have other things to think about. <laughs> we react sanely and normally, and we will find that this has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. That is the miracle of it. We are not fighting it, neither are we, we avoiding temptation. So all this about triggers. No, I can go anywhere today where alcohol is served. I can be with friends who are drinking. My daughter is not an alcoholic. She drinks wine. And I can, I'm, I'm in the middle of it. And I never even consider it. You know, alcohol is not a problem. It doesn't exist for me anymore. We feel as though we had been placed in a position of neutrality. Safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. We're recovered. We're recovered alcoholics now. We are neither cocky nor are we afraid. That is our experience. That's their experience and that is my experience. That is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. And here is a condition again. As long as we keep in fit spiritual condition and I do the things required from me. Now it's my responsibility. Now it's the protege's responsibility. If we've taken somebody through the steps, it's now their responsibility to live, live this, this life now. I can't do anything more. They know how to do inventory. If you look at that, if you look at the, the, the uh, watch ask turn on, play, on step 10, if we look for continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment and fear, that's step four and step 10. When we, these things crop up, we ask God at once to remove them, step three, step seven. We discuss them with someone immediately and make amends quickly if we've harmed anyone. Step five, step eight and nine. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Step 12. You see, in step 10, we're practicing these principles in all our affairs. The whole, the whole thing is there daily. But it's easy, it says, to land up on a spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. Somebody once said that the Greeks, you know, if you rested on your laurels in Greece, you're wearing them in the wrong place. You're supposed to be wearing your laurels around your head, not your backside. <laughs> they said we're headed for trouble as we do alcohol is a subtle foe we are not cured of alcoholism you see I call myself a recovered alcoholic people here cured I'm not I'm still an alcoholic I have a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition every day is the day we must carry the vision sounds like a meditation to me you see, turning my thoughts to someone I can help might necessarily, that there might not be somebody there to help immediately. So I turn my thoughts to someone I can help. Meditation. I've asked God to remove them, I turn my thoughts. So we have this vision of what God's will is for me in all of our activities. And do you think they mean all of my activities? If I can't take God into any of my activities, should I be doing that activity? Can I ask myself that question? Is there anything that I do that I wouldn't have God with me when I do it? Then maybe I shouldn't be doing it. And then this is the vision. How can I best serve thee? Thy will not mine be done. 
again constantly it says these thoughts must go with us constantly we can exercise our willpower upon this line all we wish it is the constant it is the proper use of the will we can use our will now because we're asking for guidance we'll see now as we go through this into step is the step 11 that this step 10 is what we do during the through the day we're watching we're asking we're turning through the day we're saying thy will be done thy will be done thy will be done oh that going not going my way thy will be done <laughs> not going my way anymore thy will be done happens a lot with me the stuff doesn't go my way an awful lot but those so, te those ten step promises are absolutely yeah. stunning so I've got my sanity back and my will back but it's a new will I try to live by God's will aligned with God's will all the time all the time thy will be done not mine I'm not running the show watch ask turn watch ask turn God's will is going that way I'm going this way I start to go that way I've got to turn and align my will back with God's will I constantly go up and align my back I constantly do this constantly I'm off over here somewhere this is what I want what God wants is over here these are thoughts which must go with us constantly we can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish it's the proper use of the will much has already been said about receiving strength inspiration and direction from him who had all has all knowledge and power if we have carefully followed directions here's the word directions again it's not suggestions anymore Bill got his way we have begun to sense the flow of his spirit into us to some extent we have become God conscious we have begun to develop this vital sixth sense vital meaning life-giving <coughs> but we must go further and that means more action step 11 suggests prayer and meditation we shouldn't be shy on this matter of prayer better men than we are using it constantly it works if we have the proper attitude and work at it it would be easy to be vague about this matter yet we believe we can make some definite and valuable suggestions okay we have two suggestions on this page we have two practices on this page and this page is when we retire at night which originally used to be when we wake up in the morning on the original manuscript but I'm really pleased they do it at night I actually quite like the idea I finish my day with a review we've been watching throughout the day where we are selfish self-centered dishonest and afraid what's the first thing it asks us to do when we retire at night we constructively review our day note this says constructively and then it says where where were we resentful selfish dishonest or afraid sounds like step four to me again yet again it's step four where was I so I get a second chance to do step 10 in my step 11 review if I've missed anything during the day I get a second chance at it so I don't go to sleep with holding a resentment that's why I like it at night and it says when we retire at night doesn't mean to say you've got to do this last thing at night you can do it when you come home from work while you're still fairly fresh you can do it before supper or whatever before you switch the TV on TV is a killer for this. Seriously, is. Do I own apology? And and I I answer these questions. If I don't, if I don't, I've got a particular form that I've, I've was we laminated it. We got it by the bed. We I've made these questions into a form. Constructively review my day. Who have I helped today? Uh, what have I achieved today? Um, etc and then I ask these questions and it's a list of questions if I don't I go to page 86 in the big book and I just answer these questions here it is just answer the question now, do I own an apology yes or no if so write down who it is I owe the apology to do it first thing in the morning 
Have I kept something to myself I should have discussed with someone at once? Or another person at once? That sounds like step 10 again. Watch our turn. Were we kind and loving towards all, the principle by which we're supposed to live? What could I have done better? Were I thinking myself all, uh, of myself all the time? Or was I thinking about what I could do for others? Was I thinking about what I could pack into the stream of life? doesn't mean to say I've got to be busy, 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 busy all the time. What it means is, what am I giving back? What am I giving back into life? What am I putting back into life? Because I was always a taker. I need to be putting back into life now. But we must be careful not to drift into worry, remorse or morbid reflection, for that would diminish our usefulness to others. After making our review, we ask God's forgiveness and inquire what corrective measures should be taken. So we ask again. Please God forgive me for my failings today because of my failings I wasn't able to be as effective as I could have been for you. Please remove my arrogance and my fear and please show me tomorrow how to put these things right. Kind of thing. You make up your own prayer if you wish. We kind of have. <laughs> One of the great things, the things I tell you what's some right this now, if you're in a relationship with someone that's doing on a 12-step program, do nightly review together. It's wonderful. You can do it about the relationship and then you can do it about yourselves. But do it together. It's wonderful. Do this next bit together too. <laughs> Do you want to do on awakening? Mm. On awakening, let us think about the 24 hours ahead. We consider our plans for the day. I think about what I'm going to do today. You know, oh, well, I'm going to work, I'm going uh, uh, shopping, whatever I'm going to do. I'm going to a meeting tonight. I have a sort of a, a, a plan. I consider my plans. For, for the day. But before I begin, at once in the morning when I wake up, because it's not alcohol waiting for me, it's self waiting for me when I wake up. It's all about me. You know, the first, my thinking has been the same for so many years that, that when I wake up, if, if I have to cut my thinking, because otherwise it's all about me. How am I today? What am I going to do? Oh, I have to do that, and I have to go out and smoke, and I have to do this, and I have to do that. And it's all about me. And I have to cut that directly in the morning. How am I today? <laughs> How do I feel today? You know, it's all about me. So I have, to, I have to cut it directly in the morning. So the first thing I do when I... My eyes goes open. I ask God to direct my thinking. Please, God, direct my thinking today. Especially asking for being divorced from self-pity, dishonest or self-seeking motives. Please direct my thinking today. First waking breath. Yeah. Seriously, first waking breath. Please, God, direct my thinking. Especially to be divorced from self-pity, dishonest and self-seeking motives. It gets to be a habit. First waking breath. If I, if I go to the bathroom first, go and have a cup of coffee or whatever it is first, then I'm running yeah. the show. So this is good. This is wonderful. <laughs> good. Under these conditions, we can employ our mental faculties with assurance. For after all, God gave us brains to use. So I get my brain back as well. Mm, nice. Our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared of wrong motives. In thinking about our day, we may face indecision. I don't know what to do. I get confused. What to do? I get maybe confused. I don't know what to do, you know. I may not be able to determine which course to take. Here we ask God for inspiration. Please, God, give me an inspiration, an intuitive thought or a decision, and I relax and take it easy. 
And I remember this in the beginning when I was just newly sober, new sober, and my brain was just running. I had a million monkeys chattering in my head. And I got this despair feelings. I don't know what to do. And my, you know how it feels. And I just, you know, I really could turn, relax and take it easy. I sat down. Please, God, help me. All is well. Guide me. Direct me. Show me what my next step is to be. Just take it easy and relax. And it worked for a crazy alcoholic like me with a thousand monkeys in my head, you know. And it worked every time. Every time I could turn, turn, turn. And that's what I did. And it's so beautiful to see that this really works, you know. If I do it, I have to do it. This is the, the, the thing with all this. You have to do it. If you don't do it, nothing happens. The thousand monkeys in your head will be a million monkeys. You know, that's how I'm wired. I have to do this. I have to do this. The other thing to remember is when this book was written, there were some people in New York who understood what Eastern meditation was. But the meditation they are talking about here is reflection upon a subject. And so the subject is my day. We are meditating about my day. What's my plan for today? Please, God, show me what order I'm supposed to do this in, if, if, I, if I'm confused. And I ask, and then I relax and take it easy and listen. Hmm. The right answer will come if my house is... If, 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 if surprised how the right answers come. I sometimes write down the answers. In case I forget. Can it be short memory? It'll be short memory. It says that sometimes here that this occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. Don't expect it to happen tomorrow. Practice, practice, practice. It says here we are often surprised how the right answers come after we have tried this for a while. It means I have to practice it. I have to do it. What used to be a hunch or the occasional inspiration gra gradually becomes a working part of the mind. Being still inexperienced and having just made conscious contact with God. Because I work these steps fast. Maybe in, hopefully in 30 days. You know, I'm just new. Just made conscious contact with God. It's not probably pro probable, probable that we are going to be inspired at all times. We might pay for this presumption in all sorts of absurd actions and ideas. Nevertheless, we find that our thinking will, as time passes, be more and more on the plane of inspiration. And we come to rely upon it. The the thing about don't be frightened of absurd <laughs> absurd sorts of actions and ideas. Don't be frightened of those. They will probably come. That's why you've got a sponsor. Run and buy him first or her first. I used to get really, really good ideas in the early days, and I ran by my sponsor, and they said, mm, maybe you don't want to look at that again. No. Mm. That's okay. So don't do this on your own. Check with people. The Oxford group had something that Bill didn't like. He called the four absolutes. He didn't include them in our program. That's why we got sponsors. Because he had the, the, the Oxford group had a way of checking their thinking. We had, Bill didn't like it, so we haven't got it. You can do some research on it. Call the four absolutes. It's a good way of checking your thinking. However, find your sponsor. If you get a really, really good idea, find your sponsor. I, 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 <laughs> I still do. I get a really, really good, amazing idea. I'm going to find my, find my sponsor first, see whether <laughs> if it checks out. And then it says we conclude the period of meditation with a prayer that we'd be shown throughout this day what my next step is to be and please grace me, Father, whatever I need to take care of the problems of life today. I ask especially, Lord, that you free me from the bondage of self-will. We're careful and make no requests for ourselves, however. We can if others would be helped. So again, I'm not demanding from God. I'm not telling God what I want God to do anymore. 
which is what I used to do. Many of us have wasted a lot of time doing that. It doesn't work. We can easily see why. Hmm. And, and at the bottom, there's another, there's another little piece that we can add on to our daily practice of step 10. As we go through the day, we pause. This is the hmm. hardest thing I do. Hmm. This is so hard to do. We pause when <laughs> agitated or doubtful. We ask for the right thought of action. We constantly remind ourselves we are no longer running the show. Humbly ask, saying to ourselves many times each day, Thy will be done. Not going my way, Thy will be done. Not going my way, Thy will be done. The pausing is the hardest thing I do. Um, somebody once said, told me that try taking three conscious breaths. You get agitated or excited, or, 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 or excited, take three conscious breaths. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, then ask God. I, it's the hardest thing I do. I'm a reactor. I get agitated and doubtful, then I pause. <laughs> if you see what I mean, after I've reacted. <laughs> but it, it does say that we are, it, right on the, very, on, on the very page 88, it says, it works, it really does. And I can guarantee you that that's what it does. It works, it really does. And it says, we alcoholics are undisciplined, so we let God discipline us in the simple way of just outlined. What way have they just outlined? Watch, ask, turn. Nightly review. Daily quiet time. Quiet time in the morning. Ask to be shown throughout the day. Consider your plans for the day. Ask God to come with you into the day. Don't do any of this alone. We're not doing any of this alone anymore. We're taking God with us constantly. Constantly. It's this intimate relationship with this power that the steps take us to. And it grows and it grows and it grows and it grows. And the quickest way it can grow is by doing step 12. Step 12 is, if we look at step 12 in the, in, in the, in the steps on page 60, and it's really interesting that, the, 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 cosmically again, the first 11 steps are on page 59. And then page 60 is a separate step, and it's by itself, and it's right at the top of the page. And it says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. The first 11 steps produce a spiritual awakening sufficient to recover from alcoholism. I have had a spiritual awakening by working the first, the first 11 steps. It says, the result. This is the AA message. Hmm. What is the AA message? The AA message is that having had a spiritual awakening as a result of the steps. The steps produce the AA. That's what we are built upon. The Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is built upon what is in this book, which is the 11 steps that bring about a spiritual awakening. The 12th step says that having had that spiritual awakening, we try to carry this message to other alcoholics. This message, that if you work the first 11 steps of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, you will have a, a spiritual awakening sufficient to overcome alcoholism. That is the AA message. There is no other. We don't have another message. It's all we got. But by golly, what a message. Hmm. You see, what I've learned about these steps is, these 12 steps are the steps that many, many uh, philosophical and religious um, uh, practices, the, the, the mystics of those, do to reach God. They take a lifetime doing what we do in 12 steps that take them to this intimate relationship with God. And here we are, a bunch of drunks that somewhere way back in 1930, 35 or whatever, somebody came across six things that he made into 12 after prayer and meditation that give us bite-sized pieces that take us knee-walking, tongue-chewing drunks from a place where we can't even find our ass with both hands to a place where we've got a <laughs> conscious contact with the power that runs the universe and we are asking that power to help us on a daily basis and we have an intimate relationship with that power. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. And I believe that if anybody wanted that, that anybody, not just our colleagues, anybody that would want to have that intimate relationship can follow our steps. But our lives depend upon this. We don't do this as casual, as a hobby. Our lives depend upon this. We don't get to a place where we're up on top of a mountain, you know, 
and 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 we're we're this big spiritual we become spiritual giants no 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 this gets us to a place where we can go out and mix it with the ordinary people the flatlanders out there without alcohol that's where it takes us it doesn't take us to anywhere special however if we continue and continue to practice to practice to practice we grow and we grow in effectiveness and we go in we we grow in, in this relationship with this power it's an amazing thing. Uh, it's just stunning. We just accept them as being the twelve steps on the wall, you know. But but this these things are are just so amazing, and amazingly they've been written down for us just in time for me. You know. So we tried to carry this message to alcoholics. So it says we tried. It doesn't say whether we're successful or not. We try. It's the action of getting up and trying. Practice these principles in all our affairs. Well, we looked at that. Step 10 and 11, practicing these principles in all our affairs. Chapter 7. Chapter 7 is, again, precise directions on how to do a 12-step call. The first half of that, up until page, um, page 96, Page 89 to 96 tells you, first of all, where to find alcoholics. Gives you all sorts, of, all sorts of ideas about where to find alcoholics. It then tells you how to talk to the alcoholic. It tells you what to tell him. And it tells you what not to tell him. And it tells you when to leave and when to shut up. And it tells you a little bit of history about what happened with, with, with Bill and about when not to go talk to somebody. And on page 96, to the end of that, it talks about sponsorship, where it says, suppose you are now taking your, making your second visit to the alcohol, to a man or to a woman. And that's a, from then onwards, it's about sponsorship. And they're going to give you some ideas about how to work with someone now, how you grow and how you walk shoulder to shoulder. Let's have a look at some of the things we say, because it's really interesting. Practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. <coughs> it works when others' activities fail. This is our twelfth suggestion. Carry this message to other alcoholics, exclamation mark. They're yelling it. <coughs> They're saying it out loud. Carry this message. What message? Do the 11 steps, you get in contact with God. <laughs> You're now working for God. You're his agent. You can help when no one else can. Nobody talks to an alcoholic like another alcoholic. Nobody can talk to another alcoholic like an alcoholic. You can secure their confidence when others fail. Remember they are very ill. We're not anymore. We're recovered now. We're not very ill. We forget. We've got an incredible short memory. We can't remember what it was like. And then it says, life will take on new meaning. To watch people recover, to see them help others. That's the amazing thing. To see one of your, one of your brothers eh, sitting in the corner with a newcomer with a big book. It's just, it just blows me away every time. To watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, have a host of friends, this is an experience you must not miss. You must not miss this. Frequent contact with newcomers and each other is the bright spot of our lives. Then it tells us where to look for alkies. And one of the great things of places to look for alkies is in places like this. A lot of alkies come to churches. A lot of alkies talk to, talk to priests, rabbis and ministers. They know where they are. Doctors, hospitals, all that stuff. They're not hard to find. Alkies are really hard, really easy to find. Just takes a little bit of effort. But you see, one of the things is, one of the things about the spiritual path, and, and all the spiritual paths say this, that when you've been up the mountain, you've got to return. When you've been up the mountain, you can't stay up the mountain. You've got to come back down the mountain, back into life. And take back what you've got. And give back what you've got. 
Nobody stays up the mountain. If they stay up the mountain, they'll live in the spiritual life. They come back down the mountain with what they found on the mountain and they start to give it back. And in fact, it's almost impossible not to. However, alcoholics have such a big ego that we can shut that out and go, no, no, it's all mine. <laughs> the directions start really on page 91. And if you want a short version of this, look at what they did with Fred in More About Alcoholism. Look at Fred's, Fred's story, the way they 12-step Fred. See your man alone if possible. First engage in general conversation. After a while, turn the talk to some phase of drinking. Do you think those are direct directions? You, there's a script here. You don't have to know how to do 12-step work. Follow the script. It's very simple. And then it says, tell him enough about your drinking habits, symptoms and experiences to encourage him to drink, to talk, talk, speak of himself. We're not telling them about the solution. We don't tell them about the solution until we've done what the big book does. The big book spends 52 pages giving us a killer case of alcoholism until we're ready. Say, yes, yes, I get it. I can't. I am hopeless. I am, I am helpless. I, I need some kind of power in my life. Then they tell us how to get well. And that's exactly how they do 12-step in here. In Fred's, Fred said, oh, no, 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 I, no, no, I, I know myself now. That's okay. I know myself. And they said, okay, fine, fine, terrific. All right, we're out of here. They told him what they knew about alcoholism, but they didn't tell him about the solution. They said, okay, fine. Well, if you ever have a problem again, give, here's our number. We'll come, you know, give us a call. He ended up in hospital a year later. The doctor phoned up Bill and he said, that guy Fred's back. And they went to see him and they said, okay, Fred, what about it now? How's it working for you? Your self-knowledge. And he said, didn't work. But not only did they say it didn't work, and they said, okay, fine, now you're ready for the solution. No, no, no. They then heaped upon him evidence from their own experience about how his state of mind worked in them and how he was really hopeless. So even though he said, no, no, I get it, I get it, guys. No, I'm end up back in hospital. I know I'm a hopeless drunk. They continued to tell him how hopeless he was until he went to the stage where, okay, guys, okay, I really get it. I really get it. Okay, what do you do? And then they told him what they did. But until he said, what do you do, they didn't. Okay? It's important that. I think that is important. And we want to know how you drank. I want to know how you drank. And I'm talking to you, I want to know how you drank. I'm encouraging you to talk about your drinking. It says, if he wishes to talk, let him do so. Thus you would get a better idea how to, how to proceed. If he is not communicative, give him a sketch of your drinking career up to the time you quit. But say nothing for the moment on how that was accomplished. Sketch. Bill does it in eight pages in Bill's story. Bill gives us a sketch and, and study that as a as a object lesson on how to tell your story. Bill's 12 step dust in Bill's story, the first eight pages. He drank for about 15, 20 years. Dr. Bob drank for about 30 odd years. He does about the same about the same amount of space in Dr. Bob's nightmares, about eight pages about his descent into hopeless alcoholism. They don't tell us very much about who they married, about what they did, about what kind of weather they had, where they lived, what kind of car they drove, nothing like that. But what they do tell us is the stages of the descent, where they hit the steps going down the steps, if you should. You sometimes don't hit them every time. You fall downstairs, you don't hit every step. <laughs> and they tell us about the descent. They tell us a bit the, the stages, if you like, the important stages when drinking becomes more than just blotting out. Wasn't it? it becomes medicine. It becomes then it becomes something that we I'm, I'm treating myself with medicine. Then I can't do without it at all. And then in the end, I'm in blackout after blackout after blackout after blackout. And I don't know what the hell's going on. And then I'm starting to take medicine as well with it and all this kind of stuff. And I show up in, in sanitariums and hospitals and whatever. That's what we tell them. But we don't tell them how we got well. Not yet. If he's in a serious mood, dwell on the troubles liquor has caused you. Okay, so we make his serious mood even more serious. Doesn't say we pat him on the back and said, all oh, will be well. No, 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 we, we take him deeper. 
so he sees he's more hopeless being careful not to moralize or lecture if his mood is light tell him humorous stories about your escapades get him to tell some of his do you see how precise that is so we don't need a script when he sees you know all about drinking commence to describe yourself as an alcoholic don't call him one I call myself one he will eventually say what I said, which is, well, if you if you think like a duck, walk like a duck, drink like a duck, you must be a duck. I did. I drank, and I thought, and I, I things happened to me exactly the same as Billy. He called himself an alcoholic, so I had to say, well, I reckon I must be alcoholic because I'm just like you, Billy. Then he told me about the struggles he made to start. He he took to stop. It was just says, yeah, give him an account of the struggles you made to stop. Show him the mental twist that leads to the first drink of a spree. We suggest you do this as we have done in chapter on alcoholism. I drank when I was happy. I drank when I was sad. I drank when I was in a relationship. I drank when I was out of a relationship. I drank when I didn't have when I didn't have a job. I drank when I had a job. If he is an alcoholic, he will understand you at once. He will match your mental inconsistencies with some some of his own. Want to continue? No, you continue. Okay. If you're satisfied, he's a real alcoholic. So I've got to make a decision whether you're alky or not by listening to what you're telling me. Not whether he's got to make a decision, I've got to make a decision. If I'm satisfied with a real alcoholic, uh, tell him the solution, no. Dwell on the hopeless feature of the malady. If I'm a real alcoholic, I'm going to drink again and again and again. My mind will always take me back to another drink, always take me back to another drink. It may be a week, maybe a month, maybe a year, maybe five years, maybe ten years if I'm an alcoholic, it's anonymous and not working the steps. But I will go drink again. Big Mick took him 20, 27 years until he picked up a drink. Show him how you experience the queer mental condition surrounding the first drink prevents the normal functioning of the willpower, page 24. Don't at this stage refer to this book unless he's seen it and wishes to discuss it. Be careful not to brand him an alcoholic. Let him draw his own conclusion. If he sticks to the idea, he can still control his drinking and possibly can if he is not too alcoholic. That's a joke. Okay? It's like being pre uh, being an alcoholic. It's like being pregnant. You either is or you isn't. <clears throat> you can't be a little bit alcoholic. <laughs> but insist if he is severely affected, severely affected, there may be little chance that he can recover by himself. Nobody's patting this guy on the back and saying, we love you till you can love yourself. We're pulling the carpet from underneath him. We want him to crash. We want him to understand the hopelessness. Continue to speak of alcoholism and illness, a fatal malady. Talk about the conditions of mind and body which accompany us. Keep his attention focused mainly on your personal experience. Explain many are doomed who never realize their predicament. It says, we, we, earlier on, it said that this condition has arrived many, years before it's re realized. And then it talks about doctors not being able to tell him, loathe to tell people. That's because they don't have a solution. I think that's changed a certain amount. I think doctors are quite happy to tell people about stuff these days. But when this book was written, doctors didn't tell people about alcoholism because the cure for alcoholism was to lock you up for the rest of your life. For alcoholic insanity, you never got out. And you ended up having things like frontal lobotomies and 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 uh, uh, convulsive electro electroconvulsive therapy to try and cure you of alcoholism, but you very rarely got out if they locked you up. That's why doctors didn't want to tell you because it was a life sentence. And it, then it says at the bottom, it says even though you're a protege, and they don't call they don't call them sponsees. There's no such word. I've looked it up in a dictionary. There's no such word as sponsee. All right? It doesn't exist in the English language. It only exists inside Alcoholics Anonymous, and it hasn't made it outside of Alcoholics Anonymous. They call them protégés, prospects. Dr. Bob used to call them pigeons. They said, why do you call them pigeons, Dr. Bob? Because they have the habit of flying away. <laughs> <laughs> he said, if your protégé is not, not entirely admitted, he has become very curious to know how you got well. Well, if you do the right job, you, he has. Let him ask that question, if you will, and then it says, tell him exactly what happened to you, which is what, Dr. what Bill does after ch page eight. The bit that I said that you underline everywhere where you have resistance to. 
Tell him exactly what happened to you. Italics. Neon. Stress the spiritual feature freely. As people say, don't talk about God on the first call. It tells you here you do. If the man be agnostic or atheist, make it emphatic that he does not have to agree with your conception of God. Billy said to me in the first call, he said, that you're going to hear about God. There's two things you need to know about God. There is one, ain't you? He can choose any conception you like, provided it makes sense to him. So if I'm going in 12-step call, I don't give him my God. Up to him. The main thing is that he'd be willing to believe. Just willingness. This step is this idea. Step two. Are you willing to believe that there's a power working me which can, can you can, can work in you? And he lived by spiritual principles. <coughs> Twelve steps. And then it says you better use everyday language in describing spiritual principles. And the easy way of doing that is to do something like step one is a surrender. Step two is the hope. Step three is a decision to do the, do the rest of the steps. Step four is a house clean, cleaning out the attic to allow, give space for the power to come in. Step five is telling it to somebody else. Step six and seven is asking that power to come in. Step eight and nine is about clearing up your mess. Step 10 and 11 is making sure you don't make more mess. And step 12 is carry that message. There it is. Everyday terms, just like that. Nothing special, just like that. And that's exactly how Billy said, told me, just like that, in about the same amount of time. And I went, oh, that sounds great. But then I saw him on the, on the wall when I went to the first meeting, and it said, made amends to all people. I went, oh, all people we'd harmed. And I, oh, don't like that one much. But by the time I got there, I was willing to do it. You see, we look at the steps and we say, I, th I don't, I personally, I, I personally not sure that we should have the steps on the wall, to be honest. What I'd like to see on the wall is page 24. I would like yeah. that in big letters. I'd like page 24 in big letters on the wall of every meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. That we are, part of this idea that we cannot bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the, the, the suffering and the humiliation of even a woman. And that's, that's a good one. <coughs> And then they talk about, at the bottom of page 93, they talk about 12-step in people of the cloth. Priests, rabbis, ministers. They're not immune to alcoholism just because they believe in God and serve God and the best they think they're doing it. <clears throat> it seems to be particularly, particularly uh, prevalent in the, in the religion I was brought up in. There's a hell of a lot of, there's a hell, hell of, a lot of alcoholic Catholic priests, it seems to me. I'm not quite sure what that's about. <laughs> I've come across quite a few. There's a lot in Alcoholics Anonymous. There's been over the years, there's been quite a few very, very, very vocal Catholic priests in Alcoholics Anonymous. But you see, just because they're a priest doesn't mean so they're, they're, they're immune from alcohol. It's not belief in God. They're still blocked off from the power just like we are by selfishness, self centeredness, dishonesty, and fear. Isn't that interesting? Monks, nuns, priests, rabbis. So now we got him. And what we're doing is we're setting the hook. We're telling him about alcoholism. We're telling him how hopeless he is. And then he comes, oh, okay, so yeah, I'm hopeless. How do we do it? Zip, gotcha. And now I tell him about and he's desperate enough to do it. We, we, take, we do straight away. I, I, it says here uh, on page 95, it says, unless your friend wants to talk further about, about himself, do not wear out your welcome. We let him talk. Give him a chance to think it over. How about Bill? Bill Dodson? Do you want to do? Do you want to look at number three? Since you got him there. Yeah, I got him here. But I, I just, you know, step twelve is is the essence of the program. This is what it's all about. You know, having had a spiritual experience, I try to carry this message to other alcoholics. This is what I am supposed to do. If I don't give away what I have got so freely, I won't keep sober. I won't keep sober because when I, to help others, that's the juice in my life today to be able to give this away. And it's crucial. And I mean, if I've had a spiritual awakening and I don't give it away, how selfish isn't that? 
This is not an option. Well, you have to help other alcoholics or you won't keep sober and you won't be happy because you will go back into yourself and your mind again. You know, I get out of my mind when I help another alcoholic. When I ha try and help another alcoholic through this program, I forget about myself. I get out of my mind. That's the juice in my life. And I can't live without that today. You know, what am I, I, I have tried just to be like normal people, just work, laugh at, at, uh, with the co-workers, uh, talk about uh, curtains, whatever. I can't do that. I have to have this. This is the juice. This is the essence of this program. The 12 step. And even if I don't succeed, I have to try. I have to try and give this away. And I just want to read this uh, from Bill's story first when Abby visited him. And my friend, Abby, had emphasized the absolute necessity of demonstrating these principles in all my affairs. Particularly was it imperative to work with others as he had worked with me. Faith without work is dead, he said. And how appallingly true for the alcoholic. For if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life, to keep in fit spiritual condition, I live in 10 and 11 and 12 I have to help others to keep in fit spiritual condition. That's just it. Through work and self-sacrifice. Have I ever done any self-sacrifice before in my life? I've been a taker all my life. This is so new. I can be of use to other people. I was a busted up drunk. And this is the juice of this program, you know, and I think this is so powerful. Work and self-sacrifice for others. He could not survive. He could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. It means it's going to come low spots ahead, you know. Help, helping someone else gets me out of that. Now, life happens. If he did not work, he would surely drink again. And if he drank, he would surely die. And then faith would be dead indeed. With us, it's just like that. And with me, it's just like that. I, I know this. I know why I'm here, you know, to try and carry this this message, not my message, this message, these clear-cut directions how to come from point A, busted up drunk, to point B, recovered alcoholic with a spiritual experience. And I cannot keep that to myself. Selfishness, self-centeredness, that is the root of my problem. I have to be useful to others and have a, and it gives me a meaningful life my life had no meaning earlier just to satisfy my my own what i wanted what i needed and this is so totally different and this is a theme going all through the book it's not an option you just have to try and give this away and I had an example, 10 minutes, um, how, how uh, Dr. Bob and um, Bill <laughs> did with the third member. What is the page? Number three. Yes. Just yes. while we're looking for that, yes. uh, say my, my alcoholic thinking is that once I've done the 12 steps, I'm going to live in a bed of roses. There are going to be beautiful sunsets every day and nothing bad's going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. Don't work like that. No. Sorry. 
the disillusion you. But if we're spiritually fit, and if we have, if we, if we're doing what we're doing, what they've asked us to do, the certain trials and low spots ahead, we use to increase our contact with this power, and we grow through that. Okay. Yeah, Bill and Bob visited the third member on the hospital, and he was really in bad shape. And after a while, Bill said, well, now you've been talking a long, good time. Let me talk a minute or two. <laughs> so after hearing some more of my story, he turned around and said to Doc, well, I, and I don't think he knew I heard him. This is um, um, Bob Dodson. Uh, telling this story. I, d I don't think he knew I heard him, but I did. And he said, well, I believe he's worth saving and working on. And they said to me, first question, do you want to keep quit drinking? It's none of our business about your drinking. We're not up here trying to take any of your rights or privileges away from you. But we have a program whereby we think we can stay sober. Part of that program is that we take it to someone else who needs it and wants it. Now, if you don't want it, we'll, we're not going to take up your time and we'll be going and looking for someone else. That's what they said to him. And he was really sick. Take, the sounds like take it or leave it to me. Take it or leave it. The next thing they wanted to know, question two, was if I thought I could quit on my own accord, without any help, if I could just walk out of the hospital and never take another drink. If I could, that was wonderful. That was just fine. And they would very much appreciate a person who had that kind of power. But they were looking for a man who knew they, he had a problem and knew he could not handle it in himself and needed outside help. The next thing they wanted to know, question three, was if I believed in a higher power. I had no trouble there because I had never actually ceased to believe in God and had tried lots of times to get help but hadn't succeeded. Next, they wanted to know, would I be willing to go to this higher power and ask for help, calmly and without any reservations? And that was question four. And they, they left me to think this over. They left me. And I lay there on that hospital bed and I went back over and reviewed my life. I thought of what liquor had done to me, the opportunities that I had discarded, the abilities that had been given me, and how I had wasted them. And I finally came to the conclusion that if I didn't want to quit, quit I certainly ought to want to. <laughs> and that, that I was willing to do anything in the world to stop drinking. I was willing to admit to myself that I had hit bottom, that I had gotten hold of something that I didn't know how to handle myself. So after reviewing these things and realizing what liquor had cost me, I went to this higher power that to me was God without any reservation and admitted that I was completely powerless over alcohol and that I was willing to do anything in the world to get rid of the problem. In fact, I admitted that from then on, I was willing to let God take over instead of me. And here he could see that his way hadn't worked at all. Each day I would try to find out what his will was and try to follow that rather than trying to get him to always agree that the things I thought up for myself were the things best for me. So that's the tent. Yes. So they came back and I told them, and I think it was Doc. He said, well, do you want to quit? And I said, yes, Doc, I would like to quit at least for five, six or eight months until I get things straightened up and begin to get the respect of my wife and some other people back and get my finances fixed up and so on. And then they both laughed very heartedly and said, 
That's better than you've been doing, isn't it? Which, of course, was true. They said, well, we've got some bad news for you. <laughs> it was bad news for us, and it will probably be bad news for you. Whether you quit six days, months, or years, if you go out and take a drink or two, you'll end up in this hospital, tied down, just like you've been in these past six months. You are an alcoholic, <laughs> they told him. As far as I know, that was the first time I'd ever paid any attention to that word. I figured I was just a drunk. And they said, no, you have a disease, and it doesn't make any difference how long you do without it. After a drink or two, you'll end up just like you are now. And that certainly was real disheartening news at the time. Well, that's just, I think it's so good, you know, because this was Bill and Bob when they were only two. And they knew we have to go and work with an alcoholic to keep ourselves sober. And they called the hospital and asked, do you have a drunk there? Yeah, we have a really bad one. He's tied down at the moment, you know. And they went there, and this was what they did. The questions, I think it's interesting. And this is what we have to do. This is what the program is all about. That's why I'm alive today. That's God's will for me. That's why I am his agent. To try and do his will and perform his work well. Otherwise, selfishness, self centeredness, that is the root of my problem. I have to give it away to be able to keep it. Otherwise, my sick mind comes back. And that's how it works. Yeah. One quick thing if you read Fred and you read Bill Dodson, Alcoholic number three, and you read Working with Others, the first half of Working with Others, you will see that they got up to the third step. They didn't do the third step on the first call. They left them to think it over. They gave them a killer case of alcoholism and then left. Think it over. This is what we do. Think it over. Come back the next day. That's what Billy did. Billy did exactly that. He came and told me, give me a killer case of alcoholism. He said, we have some steps. If you're willing to start the steps, we can do step three. I'll come back tomorrow and see you and see whether you're willing to do step three. He came back the next day and he said, are you willing to do step three? I've been thinking it over. I hadn't taken a drink for 24 hours. That was the first time I hadn't taken a drink for 24 hours in a long time. And actually, if you read Bill, Bill Dodson's story, you'll see that it said that you, you can quit for 24 hours, can't you? You see, in order to stop drinking, you've got to stop drinking. Mm -hmm. Now, that's interesting. Now, that's where this 24 hours a day comes from, from Bill Dodson's story. But it's in the early beginning to stop drinking long enough so that you can start the work. Mm. I can't stay stopped 24 hours at a time without the power. I need the power, but I need to stop drinking in order to stop drinking. And I asked the power to stop me drinking for 24 hours. And Billy came back the next day. We did the third step. We started on this program. I got more and more power as we went along. That's what it's all about. I haven't taken a drink since. The only time that I've almost taken a drink, and I've been very close to taking a drink, was at 15 years sober when I had stopped doing what this book asked me to do. And I almost took a drink. Since then, I've been very, tried to be very conscientious and do what this book asked me to do because I don't want to go back there. I was 15 years sober and suicidal. That's bad. It was bad enough when I was drinking, being suicidal, but being sober 16 years and suicidal, I'll tell you, you don't want to go there. <laughs> okay, uh, we're pretty much there. Um, uh, we've, we've run on into that. It's, it's so, so difficult to do this. You know, this is so, so difficult to cram this all in one side. So I, I, we apologize if we missed anything. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, we rattle through it as best we can. Um, 
so gracious for being here on such a beautiful day. Um, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Uh, we, we have we, we, today you have ensured our sobriety for, for another for another 24 hours possibly or maybe a little longer who knows but this has been a great great pleasure and, and a great privilege thanks for listening I hope you enjoyed the podcast Sobercast is ad free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way so if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.